Paul, and so welcome to, uh, I think, our third or fourth on the road trip here. So this year has been the theme. We're getting you out in the buildings and seeing the buildings and showing off some programs. And so last week was, or last month was World Languages, and um, this month we're going to show our pre-primary center that we freshly um, reopened and um, I think uh, got most of the bugs of the reopening out, but we still got some things we definitely want to do as we go forward in this building. And if you came in today, you can see it was refreshed on the one side. Robotics is our neighbor on the other side, and um, they've done a great job of moving in. But we probably want to do a little bit of work over there in time as well um, as add some more for the pre-primary center here. Um, since Penny, who supervises, wants me to go ahead and finish, I'll hand it off to Pam. She's going to start off with a presentation. We'll take a little tour around the building at the end and answer any questions you have along the way. Okay? All yours, Pam. I think we're going to do the opposite. Okay, I did. We're going to take a quick tour so we can catch kids uh, before they, they have their nap time. Perfect. Yeah, so but you're on, Pam. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Everything's good? Um, we are, um, I'm Pam Sherrill. I'm the director here. I'm not a principal. I'm the director here. Um, we're going to start just by doing some uh, room tours, um, just so you can kind of get the feel of what exactly we have. Um, even though we're small, we've got a lot going on here. So we're going to do that first, and then we'll come back. And I've just kind of got a PowerPoint here to kind of guide my, my talking and just kind of let you know, and, and then we'll have some questions and the answers at the end. Okay? So, Penny, do you want to divide them in two? Is that the best thing you think? And then we can uh, kind of gather again near the um, one of the GSRP classrooms. Okay. Um, just a quick note. Right through those double doors on the right-hand side are restrooms and refreshments here. Just take care of your needs. In this space, let's just talk about this just for a minute. Um, because we have to jump through quite a few hoops because our kids are just four years old, meaning we want to meet the expectations of MPS. We um, have GSRP guidelines, which is state-funded. So we want to make sure that we take care of all of our P's and Q's for state funding. We also jump through hoops for licensing as well. Usually the area from the screen that direction is just left as wide open area because there needs to be an area for kids to come in and do hula hoops and run and jump if it's in climate weather outside. The area up here we have kind of chosen it as our maker space because MPS has focused. And Tina has so gracefully jumped in um, as our uh, volunteer on Fridays, coming in doing STEM in this area, our, our third little rectangle table that usually comes over here, whiteboard for instruction. We use the books over there. You can see that um, some of them, we're going to have a volunteer reader come in. Um, I'll touch on that just a little bit with um, the PowerPoint, but it is our PYP um, learner, learner profiles. So that's how we kind of um, instruct at this level because they're so little. So let's just kind of move on. The office is up here. Kind of standard. Um, our Young Fives classrooms really are considered kindergarten um, by state standards. Um, but we take it a little bit slower because those kids need just a little bit more time to kind of get their entire um, self together. We're going to talk about balanced learning. Do they go to kindergarten after? They go to kindergarten after, after here. Part of um, being in a Young Fives classrooms is um, signing that that says they're going to go to kindergarten. Um, yep, it is lunchtime. And part of GSRP, the guidelines for GSRP, are that they serve family style. They sit down family style and have lunch. So I'm assuming they're at their tables. If they're not, they're going to be shortly. Um, so I think they know that we're coming. <laughs> I told her that we would be coming. What does um, GSRP stand for? Great Start Readiness Program. Okay, thank you. So in these classrooms, high scope curriculum is what's dictated by GSRP, um, but we do try to incorporate those PYP, that PYP language and that PY, PYP overarching themes as well. Um, so part of that is to sit family style. Um, in the classroom, there are eight learning areas, and the theme that they are working on usually gets embedded in those. Um, and it really is about um, play-directed learning. If 
um, so we can yeah, kind of walk through here. You're not sure what to think of all these people. <laughs> <laughs> I know, so we're all in the same way. I don't want my house to have a This area back here, um, I love the architecture in these rooms. Um, but they have their own little potties that are about eight inches off the floor. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then they can do their messy play type items uh, that are back here. Um, I don't want dinner singing. You did what? I don't want dinner singing. Let's just go back. The classroom next door is PIP. Um, they also use um, the high school kind of as a structure, but it really is the IB PYP. So the framework for IB PYP is really more their directive, where it's kind of flip flopped in these classrooms. We definitely want to expose kids to that language and expose to kids to both. But GSRP and PYP are very guarded um, with their programs and their titles and, and the, the things that go with them. Um, this, the room over here is mirror image. So we would, if we followed right through, it would be this area and then their classroom. But we're just going to loop right on that. Do you need me to keep this on while I'm doing this? Oh, no, you're fine with that. No, that works with the one that's back in the off and back in there. Oh, We've got okay. a, that's what this is for. <laughs> Okay, in here is our Spanish slash music room. So they're here on alternate days, oh, yes. they share this yes. space. Back yes. here is our art, yes. art area. Sometimes music comes in here if, they're, if they conflict. I think there's one thing that they conflict. It's okay. Next time. <laughs> She meet her profiles or ever No. But I'm like, you still really? <laughs> like, um, you know. Yes, they do. I spent so, 11 years there. Yeah, so you're familiar. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, lots of good space. Yep. And they're like, well, this is for the kiddos to use. But so who's down here? Young, young fives. fives come down here for special. So this is the art room. Um, music and Spanish are in this room. Jim is in the other room. Um, and our cafeteria as well. Okay. Yep. Okay. All right. Um, so this is really just a PowerPoint to kind of keep me on track um, as far as just kind of letting you know what's going on here. Um, oh, let's go back. Um, we kind of adapted our little crusader to be more pre-K-esque. Um, but we're still the crusaders. Um, why this? Why now? Um, just research tells us that giving kids a quality preschool experience really prepares them for su school success. Um, also, many people even today still don't know that this isn't your grandma's kindergarten that they're going into. Kindergarten has very um, stringent expectations for kiddos now. They really do need that foundational learning of preschool. Um, if for no other reason, just to learn how to be with a group and the procedures of school. Um, Plus, MPS is very committed to learning, and legislation says our kiddos really need to be ready. Um, there's a link on there for parents. So in this building, we have four-year-old programs. One is IB PYP Preschool. One is GSRP, a state-funded program, um, and the Young Fives classrooms as well. Um, Young Fives is really a choice for parents that think their kiddos maybe just aren't quite ready. Um, it's not preschool and it's not kindergarten. Um, so it is, um, re it's recognized by the state as a kindergarten, um, but what goes on in the classroom is kind of a mix. It's kind of a mix. Um, the IB PYP obviously follows all the international baccalaureate standards. The GSRP follows all of the state standards for GSRP, but we do try to mesh the two just a little bit because research tells us that it's right and good. Okay, we boast a safe environment for building relationships not only with peers but adults. Um, responsibility and self-regulation competency is huge. Um, I've had, over my years of teaching, I've had kindergarten teachers that have told me, I don't care what you do, but if you can just get them to sit and listen. Um, sit on the carpet through a story or follow a direction, I can teach them. So really that self-regulation piece, um, all of the child's social emotional well-being and development is really a big focus here. Um, we want 
children to be learners. It's not about teaching them stuff, but how is it that I can be a learner? How do I ask questions? What is a question opposed to a statement? Um, exposure to school procedures. How do we move from the carpet back to our tables? How do we move from our room down to specials? Um, sitting together in GSRP um, is another one. We're developmentally appropriate. And you know what, over my years of being involved with little ones, I've really noticed that when you say developmentally ap appropriate, people will go, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But w let's talk for just a minute about what developmentally appropriate means. Developmentally, the, the analogy I usually use with parents when I talk to them, it's like, you can be super parent of the world. You can be doing reading and math and all these things at home, but super parents of the world cannot make teeth grow faster. And if you have more than one child, you know that teeth come in at various different times and when they're good and ready. It doesn't mean you don't introduce mashed potatoes. It doesn't it mean you don't introduce those things. But there is a component to development that's going to happen when it's darn good and ready and very individualized for kids. So we try to look at the whole child. We try to do it play-based because research tells us that's what's important. And we individualize. Yep. We do do some academics, literacy, the basic five core areas of literacy, so phonemic awareness, phonics, vocabulary, reading fluency, and reading comprehension. Yep, those are the biggies. And in the fours and the fives, um, the young fives and in the four-year-old classrooms, those are biggies. It looks a little bit different because we're individualized. There isn't a canned absolute for every single classroom. It's not a canned absolute for every single child either. Um, math, again, it's that foundational learning shape, size, patterns, ability to count verbally, forward and backward, recognizing, um, subitizing, that's breaking apart, looking at the pieces, knowing the sets. Um, so really early numeracy. The PYP IB program is really, I put an asterisk there for all children because at this age we're four, four and five years old. So we're looking at no, we don't call it that, but we certainly introduce the language. We've started a new program. I'm going to have a um, volunteer come in. And in most of the teaching, she's going to come in. We've got some books that are specific to all the learner profiles. And that's how they're going to introduce. Those are big words. When you talk about what is an inquirer, what is um, being open-minded look like, what is being a risk taker look like? So we introduce that through literacy. So there's books that are just good teaching tools. So we're going to have that volunteer come in and talk about those. Um, and they do that in Young Fives as well anyway. Okay, so the mission statement in the International Baccalaureate aims to develop inquiring, knowledgeable, and caring young people who help to create a better and more peaceful world through intercultural understanding and respect. Isn't that what we want all of our kids to do? You know, just be respectful and just understand that we're all different and isn't that great? Let's celebrate it. So some of the themes that we talk about here in preschool, just like on the, uh, the wall that is out there, the grid, it shows the themes of preschool as well. Um, so we try to incorporate those, although high scope kind of allows for children to um, show their interest. So um, we find in the beginning of the year, children don't bring anything up. They try to just sit there and just go, oh, okay, whatever you tell me is what I know. So many times we'll suggest things. The direction that we take with each is then directed by the children that are in the classroom. But there's more. This screen just shows an article by Tim Elmore, and he talks about the five greatest predictors of student success. And if you just glance over those five predictors, None of them talk about knowing your ABCs and one, two, threes. It really is about social emotional development, and social emotional development is the number one predictor of school success. So, um, getting connected, obviously, that's going to be with older kids, um, but possessing adaptability, uh, adaptability and resiliency. Um, there's a bunch of research coming out now about resiliency, developing high emotional intelligence, targeting a clear outcome, and making good decisions. When we look at that resiliency piece, sometimes um, it talks about how the, the swing has been. It says, sadly, there's been an opposite effect of trying to build our children's self-esteem, um, that we're falling short. We're not letting them struggle a little bit to learn that resiliency. Um, adaptability and resiliency are priceless possessions that predict success far more than good grades and the high SAT score. So we really do need to allow our littles to struggle just a little bit 
or when I, when I do my introduction in the beginning of the year, what I like to say is when children come to you, when your own kids come to you and ask you questions, instead of answering, say, I don't know, what do you think? You know, a simple response, or mama, zip my coat, and many times you're in a hurry on the way out the door, but I'll say, you know, I'm right here for you, why don't you try it first? Because you're there then to support, but you're not there to just take it over. Competency comes from the belief that I can do it. Not that you've said, wow, you're good at that. But the competency piece comes from believing that they can and they know that they can. Because you've stood there and coached them and said, I believe in you, but you still need to struggle through it. Um, so here's just an example of a daily schedule. I was not a fan of the soft start when I was in the classroom, but I love it. Um, now that I've seen it in practice and I've seen what's happening, I've really encouraged our fours to also have that soft start. It gives you an opportunity to mingle among the kids, check in with them, how was your night, where were you over the weekend, what did you do, those types of things. Um, in our four-year-old classrooms, we have the opportunity to sit and have breakfast with them, so those are the good conversations that we get to know um, and build that relationship. Um, for our young fives, they go to specials. And we're now featuring our new STEM activity on Fridays. Thanks, Tina. <laughs> Kids are loving them. Oh, here's an example. Um, so she came, she read a book about Curious George and a friend um, that built an igloo and how the base needed to be stronger. Um, so building those STEM, the language, the attributes, and then the students went over to our STEM area and they got to construct their own igloos. And we're catching everybody but our GSRP kids, but we're leaving the materials behind. So the GSRP kiddos, because they don't attend on Fridays, they attend Monday through Thursday, the teachers can bring them in here um, at a time that works for their schedule. Um, so this is it. This is what we do. We're trying to find a balance. I think my communication to the staff in the beginning of the year was, we are all people that come from an early childhood background. So early childhood, when you're strictly early childhood, you kind of tend to be experiential and let's just take things as they come. Um, when you come from a teaching background, it's like, get it done. We have this stuff that we need to cover. So what I say is try to find that sweet spot. That sweet spot. We need to know that kids are playing to learn. We need to know that kids are doing all those good things that early childhood research has told us about. Um, but we also need to know that they are getting pushed just a little bit, just very ever so gently, um, to get them ready for what's expected in kindergarten that's not your grandma's kindergarten. That's it. That's all I have. So, questions at this point, and then we would um, maybe talk a little bit about robotics as well. well and Penny, Penny wants just a little more. No? No, just if there are questions. That's oh, we were okay. Time for questions. Hi. How many students you have in each um, left the four young five, young fives, and the four year olds? Okay, GSRP old? dictates that we can only have 16 in the classroom. In each classroom with two adults. So, that's a licensing guideline, and it's GSRP. It's a little bit Stricter than licensing. Licensing says that we can have, um, what is it, 1 to 12. But GSRP says 1 to 8. So we have to hold tight to those guidelines when you're getting um, GSRP funding. So obviously, we have to follow those. So 16 per classroom, how many classrooms? We have two classrooms of GSRP, and we have a classroom of PYP that has 19 with three adults. And as four year olds? Yes. Or how many five year olds? Three. Three, six, so, and five. so basically you have six classrooms. Correct. Fives, we, uh, young fives, it depends. We've been as high as 24 before. I think we're below that now. Yep. We're at 20. Somewhere in between 20 and 24, just like our elementary classrooms. 24 would be big, 20 would be on the low. We shoot somewhere in there depending on the demand. And you stay steady, um, full, like, you know, full. Yeah. Okay. In fact, um, our, our um, second GSRP classroom, we started the year with a little bit of a risk. We decided, um, um, <clears throat> we were going to start with, we were only funded for one, and that we were hoping to get a second. We were told we probably would not get the funding for the second one, but we wanted to serve more, more children, so we took that on. But we uh, found out maybe a month ago that we had received funding for the second GSRP, which then, once you receive seats the first year, the odds are better that you'll keep those seats and maybe add those. And so we actually technically have a seventh room here that we could add another one down the road, depending on it. The other piece I think we struggle a little bit still with, um, we got in the young five games, what time started, when, two years ago or three? 
and when we got in, we um, you know we had heard of people doing it. There were, for a while, was um, wasn't sure if how the state was going to react to Young Five. So really, Young Five, there is no such thing. It's kindergarten by the state. So <clears throat> they weren't sure how they were going to fund that. If they would fund that at all, so schools were being very cautious. But we knew Bullet Creek had started one in our own community. And when I first got here, when I began to track trends of where our enrollment is, you know, we were declining quite a bit, and we're not now. One of the things we noticed is um, we had kids starting other places who might not come to us. They'd stay, they'd have good experience. Well, the group was one. They were going out there, have a good experience. 50% would come back, 50% would stay. And we don't like that. We want them all. And so, plus, we believe that our at-risk learners, I've always been a believer that time is a variable, and so you can extend time in a lot of different ways. And um, in order to do that, one would be get them in early and just begin to uh, work with them. And so we got into the young five business, and um, we went from one section to two, and now this year three. And I question that just a little bit. Not that it's wrong or right. I just question it and say to them, what is the appropriate number? Three is about 10% of our income in getting our class is really about 10% behind. We know that some parents redshirt their kid, for lack of better words. They are ready, but they kind of want that extra buffer year. Um, and are we getting the right kids in the 60, 60-ish seats that we have in there? And so between our elementaries and the um, pre-primary, we hope to figure that out a lot better as we go, because the teachers would tell you in the kindergarten classes, there's some that would benefit from being over here. And then the teachers in the young class would say there's some that definitely should be in kindergarten still as we go forward. So, as a parent, how would you determine if they should go to kindergarten or if they would benefit from that extra time and, so and growth? So, you mentioned birthday earlier. Right. And birthday um, in our state. There's a waiver period in there, and I'll say it wrong because I'm not an expert in these things. But that's a, that's an issue there in our state, and so many times it's about what where the birthday falls and are they ready. Um, then it, as a parent or even as an educator, how do we determine it's not good right now? So for a while the state played with um, a kindergarten readiness test, which was given voluntarily, and most educators would say it's not real good. Um, I, I'm a secondary educator by trade, I always say to my elementary principals, there's got to be a pre-assessment we can do, um, and there's really no clear-cut answer on that yet on how to do that. So um, I don't know, Pam, if Pam was going to say, if, or what we generally say when parents ask that question is we say, if your child has had any experience, whether it be in Bible school, church school, um, whether it be in a preschool program elsewhere, talk to that person, talk to that teacher, um, because that's going to reflect how that child has been in the group and use the recommendation take it into your consideration as well um, many times it's birthday many times it's not we've got kiddos here and the the waiver is september to december generally we say kindergarten kids on or before september 1st they know it must be five well then you've got that kiddo that has that august birthday um, that's really cutting it close but we have kids here that are in the waiver range, if you will, that have had no prior experience that are fine. And then we've got children that turned five in the in the fall and like are old, if you will, for that group and an absolute it's a good thing that they're here kind of placement. So I would take recommendations for where your child has been exposed to groups of children and honestly trust your gut. Trust your gut. You're the mama. You know that child better than anything. If you're able to leave that child without tears, without hysteria, if that child is independent, getting their coat on, taking care of business, doing what you ask them to do, if they can follow three-step direction at night for their nighttime routine, getting ready for bed, that's a good thing. If you're, if you're a hands-on mama that you're doing everything, more than likely they're not ready. The other one we have is the tweener on the income. So GSRP has a standard that um, the, the funding comes in for. And obviously we start, started a tuition program for those who can pay. And then there's those that are just slightly above mm -hmm. that income that really probably can't afford. So our, our community um, has some scholarship availability, but they're working on more. And a little early to talk about that, because I've been told to be cautious about that. But it looks like um, our community foundation is working to begin a, an endowment fund and it probably will only fund a few seats in the beginning but someday their goal is to have hopefully all four-year-olds 
in our county be able to go to the preschool, the funding not be an issue. Um, our governor-elect, if you follow that, she says universal preschool for four-year-olds. We'll see if she can get that done or not. I 100% I, I agree with her. I'm not sure she'll be able to get it done um, right now, but we'll see where that goes. Any push that way would be good. And then we want to play with three-year-olds, but right now we don't think we're ready to do threes. <clears throat> of course, that would have to be developmentally. It's not all day. It's not every week or those pieces of it, too. Um, thank you for detailing the PYP day. I wondered if you could talk a little bit about uh, the GSRP program, what that looks like when you say, or their themes, or how that would be different. Okay, GSRP, um, like I mentioned earlier, really dictates the curriculum. The curriculum is high scope. We follow high scope. The crooks of high scope really came from the Perry High School um, research project of, gosh, 60s maybe? I don't know, but it was a very small group. It was a very small group. Um, but it really does come from that. And the crux of it, it really is the day. The schedule of the day, they do what's called a plan, do, review sequence. So you're getting that um, intentionality in your teaching. Where is it that you would like to go? They have an hour in the morning, an hour in the afternoon of what is called choice work time. They have 30 minutes in the morning, 30 minutes in the afternoon of a non-negotiable outside time, of course, you know, weather permitting. Um, but it has to be pretty extreme not to take them out there. We want the kids to have that experience. We want them to experience, you know, a little drizzle. It's good for them to understand what weather is. It's good for them to understand that. Um, but in the, the crooks of their work time, uninterrupted one hour, is really, um, they're going to come to the teacher. It's going to be very intentional. Where are you going to play today? Who are you going to play with? What are you going to do there? That type of thing. Then the child goes and does. So the plan, the do. And then when playtime is over with, they come together and in some way, shape, or form, you do what's called a review. Because that's what brain research tells us, that that's how we learn. That's a patterned way of learning. That's how we learn. So therefore, they're going to come back, oh, you told me that you were going to go to Blacks and you were going to play with Bobby and you were going to build a tower. Oh, no, no, teacher. I went to dramatic play and I played with Susie and I made eggs. Okay, then. All right, good. But you see the sequence of being able to retell. It's the crooks of literacy as well. What did I do in the beginning, the middle, and the end? You know, the, the whole sequence of how our brain works. So um, within that, there's also small group time. And there's things that are dictated. So it really, the crooks of high school is really the schedule of the day and sticking to it because that is part of the learning. Embedded in that is these themes. Okay, so a teacher might read a book that introduces um, being a risk taker. So let's start talking about that. Let's just introduce the language. It really is about the language and laying foundation. It really is about teaching all those social emotional skills because are not all those traits really part of your social emotional being. So that's kind of how we squeeze that in there just a little bit. Um, and then in the IB, PYP, IB has its own standards. It has its own guidelines and it's um, like I said, it's very guarded of its program. So she does follow somewhat of a high school because it has a good schedule of the day. It has a good flow of the day. And it has those two one-hour blocks of time that's play. And it's individually directed. So therefore, we know research tells us that it needs to be play and it needs to be kid-directed. So of course, when that's the way kids best learn, that's of course the way we're going to do it because we're trying to do the best that we can with what we know, right? Um, GSRP is four days a week because, because it dictates that that's what needs to happen. With GSRP, there's also a home um, visiting um, component. So generally, it'll happen before school and it'll happen at the end. It really is to meet that child on their own turf, to go over paperwork, to answer any questions for the parents in a more comfortable environment, not in a group. And then at the end of the year, they have that closure to talk about, wow, you have learned so much. You have grown so much. You're so ready for kindergarten. Let's see what's coming next. And hey, talk about IB, IB being integrated into the PYP or into the um, GSRP the best we can because there's some guidelines. Well, that's what I said. They're, the guidelines for GSRP are such that it's really strictly high scope, and they're very guarded of their their titles and their programs. So GSRP is very guided of the GSRP and it's very strict. It has a manual. If you go on to MDE, you can see the manual. Um, but what we try to do is the language, the learner profiles. Um, we try to integrate all of that. The kiddos are going to be included in the volunteer reader that comes so we can focus on teaching those things. 
um, because it really is about teaching the whole child. Um, some of them are stay-at-home parents, so they keep their child home. Others have alternative um, arrangements. They have alternative child care for that day. Um, so that's a little bit of an issue, and so we've um, been playing with that just a little bit. No one really has got a real good answer, and there's some GSRP programs are in, where there's also daycare programs, so the fourth day, the fifth day, they could go to that. <clears throat> we've toyed with that idea, but we're, we're also questioning the guidelines. Um, our teachers work more than the hours required for the GSRP, so we're wondering if we could offer it on the fifth day without violating that and still do the home visits and curriculum. So we're still playing with that since we're new at GSRP because um, that's a little bit of a problem for parents. For years, I've um, been doing this long enough where before it was called GSRP, it was the same program with a different name, um, the busing was not part of the component. And so we used to bus them to get them in because many of those same parents um, have, would have a real difficult time busing kids, particularly when it was a half-day program in the middle of the day. And so we do busing, and so um, I was surprised to hear the number, but it's a significant number of kids that do ride the bus to and from school. Good, good school riding skill as well is to know how to get on that bus and ride that bus and get to school as well. So. And that's a full day GSRP, full of the same Nine to four, yep. So do you have on-site daycare from like, the parents <coughs> have to go to work at 7.30? We have, um, Contracted with Campfire for the young fives. Do they have Campfire come here? Do they come Campfire here? comes here in the in the building uh, or in the room that was the first on the left here um, for a small fee. Um, we don't offer it to GSRP because we offer busing. Um, we haven't offered it this year to the PYP because the program was already in place before this building's inception. That they did the before and after care in their classroom last year. Um, but logistically and just having teachers spending time when all the kiddos are there and in for instruction is we found this year more important and being that we have campfire on site then we are working with campfire to kind of expand their program i think next year campfire expand here similar to the other elementaries and if you follow the at all early child this year with the lara the state licensing caused everybody issues um, they were very backed up, very slow, and so Campfire only didn't have their license, um, even though they had their paperwork in it probably mid last year until proved in October or something, sure. even if, even for her offsite um, piece of it. And so that that's threw everyone a little bit of a wrinkle um, for the start of the year as well. So uh, we literally had to call our state representatives and give Jim Thomas credit. He walked across the hallway to the licensing division, and suddenly certificate licensing finally started going through, but it was a problem for a while. So, um, sorry. Um, so which programs have a cost associated with them for the families? The tuition, IB, PYP. Only. Only. only one. Yeah, so that's how we first got in the game, I'm going to say three years ago, maybe off, right, three, four. Um, and so we first got in and created a one section of a tuition-based program. We had no state funding or any of that. And so that one kind of started off that way themed, and it's our only one. So Young Fives, the state pays a grant, same as you do for any other child that goes K-12, and the GSRP is a state grant. Um, a little bit less funded, but it's still pretty well funded, so. And then how does enrollment work? I'm sure it's different. I mean, is it a lottery yeah. system for the, the Young so Fives? And then tuition, we do our own enrollment. Okay. Pam will explain. Years ago, um, there was a time where they let the local do the enrollment for GSRP. And then it became where the ISD became the oversiders and seers of that. And then our ISD joined a consortium. And so we're in a large consortium. And everything has to go through that first because the first dollars in and the first one that they're eligible to exposed to would be Head Start, which is federal dollars. And then the state will come in, just our paid parent could actually choose, but they have to go through this regional one before they can ever be ours. So we literally, we literally are not allowed to enroll those kids until they get recommended to us, if I'm saying that right. So yep, the application process is midlandpreschool.org. Um, and you go on and you put an application in. They collect applications, it's a huge process. Um, I'm a little bit frustrated with the process myself. Um, we wanted to have a ice cream social on the 28th of August, and um, literally on the 26th of August, I was calling saying, can I tell them, can I tell them? Because you're not allowed to tell families because it's all a prioritization process. 
So the first criteria is income, um, and then it is age, and then we have a, an at-risk form as well. So there's risk factors involved. But coming from, they have to go to Head Start, they have to sign off at Head Start, then they come to us. It's a very lengthy process, which I think is um, not adequate um, because we want to let people know as soon as they can. So if they have to set up childcare, if they are not going to get into the program, there is a criteria in the program where 10% of your enrollment can be over income kids and there's a sliding fee for that. So many people say, oh, I don't think my income will qualify. Yes, it may. You need to go ahead and do this process because how it all washes out sometimes or you'll call somebody that originally filled out an application and they said, I've moved, I don't want your location, I want a different location. So the way it all washes out many times, yeah, it's a little bit different, but I wish it would happen much sooner uh, because right now we are starting to talk about what's gonna happen next year. We're opening enrollment February 1st for PYP, for Young Fives. We would like to do that for GSRP as well so the parents can plan ahead. Um, that's a legislator and then young tribes is slightly different and then mm -hmm. um it's think all, the young, it's think the young is kindergarten okay except for the curriculum's kind of um exposure, exposure a little bit mastery yeah. Yeah. yeah um so is this all the young fives are there young fives at any elementary buildings or are you housing it all here we're housing it all here so they can go to any one of their home school yep afterwards they, that's the idea yep okay. so we started piecemeal and now we finally decided we need to do something more with this facility so we did IB tuition program first and that was at Adams and then we added GSR one section of GSRP and that was at Plymouth and then we added um, our first uh, young fives at Plymouth Carpenter and when, Central Park. And then when, when Central Park one was closed and so we we realized that we were beginning to grow and needed to and we were hodgepodge it, there's nice to be in your home school yeah. but it was causing some room issues as well Absolutely. yep and so we were feeling a little bit tight with it or not because our enrollment stayed up next year elementary enrollment slightly went up over the years um, and so we had this facility that we had uh, promised robotics for which we'll get to um, and then um, we said hey we're going to take half of it on you and we decided we can refurbish this side and bring our young, younger programs over here free up our schools a little bit and then they go back to their schools. A little bit of a busing logistics nightmare as well, if you can imagine. Yeah, because you're yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, a, a bit of answer to your question. Um, this is not the only place that has young fives, because my kids went to a daycare that they're on fours and young fives. Well, I mean, yeah. for the district. Yes. Yeah. 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 My question goes then to, do you ever interact with those daycares that really are young five classes so, and young fours? To see that yeah. you're. So we're not the overseer. We have no know, ability I'm not to, to do to so. Just shared knowledge. Yeah. So that all, all that shared knowledge comes back through the Great Start Collaborative. Mm -hmm. We use the right word, mm -hmm. which is overseen by regional, our regional consortium. And then we have those dialogue meetings at the end through them. And so, um, yeah. And, and you know, to be honest, uh, you have providers that are um, profit providers out there who weren't very happy about NPS mm -hmm. getting into business. So. When Jerry Wasserman was a board member, one was a friend, and the guy said, what are you doing in my business? And Jerry said, well, I happen to think educating kids in our business. <laughs> but um, <laughs> so we, it, there's a fine line there, and we, we play very careful with all of that. But we, we have literally no rights. But when each kid transitions, the Great Star Club that helps with that transition. And anybody that belongs to the STARS quality program, they get exposure to all the professional development that comes through the consortium and through the ESA. My kids are old enough, they, they did their preschool stuff years yeah. ago, but yeah, I just yeah. was curious. About and years that. ago it was called early... It's MSRP. M MSRP, oh. before that. That sounds good. Yeah. Last year I was able to sit in on the, the session where the elementary school teachers were invited with the preschool te teachers mm -hmm. to, to share knowledge, and that was a wonderful meeting. Preschool from here? Or from mm -hmm. all the preschool all teachers in the city? I believe all G... All preschools that are part of the collaborative okay. are invited. Okay. So there's a lot of, um, we, we, we may give our personal thing a little bit too, but there's a lot of layers into this, and sometimes I think too many layers cost money away from the classroom, but there are a lot of regional help assistance with our teachers that come over from the Great Star Collaborative, as well as all those transitions and oversight into the other providers as well. We're no different than them on the, on the GSRP. We're just a provider, and they hold that over us. So. I don't know who's here for robotics. 
Right here. Oh, right. Right. Hi. So Patty actually might want to lead on well, this no, one. No, I just didn't know if maybe Annette wanted to share a quick summary of where we're at. Yeah. I can well, you have to be on mic. Oh, so. oh, my goodness. Oh, I can yell. Yeah. Uh, so before you, you start out, let me talk just a little bit about I guess, on that. So Everybody's going to yell. Will that work? Well, yeah. Old coach, my voice is loud, right? So. You know, robotics is growing huge, and we're 100. percent We got in early with maybe Dow High was the first program we had, and it's growing and growing. It's growing in the region, and it's wonderful. And so, um, four or five years ago, maybe one of my first years here, uh, we were approached uh, by Dow, and the money flows through a consortium, but they pay for the um, electricity and energy bills at the Franklin Center when they were in there. So we just partnered and kept our building going that piece of it. So when we wanted to transition over. Um, they continue to pay the same amount of energy that they did there. So actually, what a great partnership because, you know, we would pay a lot more energy for this building if it wasn't that partnership as well. Um, plus, they've been very good about transitioning over. We were a little worried about offending them and asking them to move, but they've moved. And along that, um, Brian worked very hard with uh, Michigan State, who had gotten some STEM grant money for a performance floor in here, a practice performance floor, a test track, if you would say, um, which you're going to touch, which I think is really kind of neat, too. And so the gymnasium spoken for. You may have wondered why we were holding some of that downstairs, because we had already committed the gymnasium uh, to the robotics. So this 100-year-old building that you're in is really getting used so seven days a week, really, between all the programs. So it, it, this is a great use of this facility. So I'll just play right. it here. Um, I'll keep this brief, because I know that you guys are getting close to being done, and we're going to take a little tour of our site as well. But I wanted to walk you just uh, very quickly through the program and why we have such a great relationship at Midland Public Schools and why it's that important. Um, we are part of an organization called FIRST, which stands for For Inspiration and Recognition of Science and Technology. But that's really kind of an acronym that doesn't cover what they are really all about. They're an international organization that believes in getting kids excited about not just STEM subjects, but also kind of in, including, I love what you guys were saying about these programs because it's an extension of that. It's about becoming part of a greater culture and a greater community and learning that we can be competitive while also being friendly. And the idea that uh, by collaborating, we actually make everybody better. So yes, I may want to win, but I also want you to play your best so that you elevate my game, essentially. So the program itself is broken into four chunks. We have uh, First Lego League Junior, or FLL Junior, which are the young elementary kids, so lower elementary. Then we have First Lego League, which is upper elementary. And then there's FTC, or First Tech Challenge, which is middle school, specifically in Michigan. And then we have the high school groups, which, are, which is FRC, or First Robotics Competition. And the program is actually built to expand their skills as they get older, to become more challenging, um, and to kind of build on everything they've learned. So in the very beginning, for the lower elementary kids, they're given a subject or a challenge that's chosen all across the entire world. So all teams all over the world are facing the same exact challenge. It's released at the exact same time all across the world. They start competing at the exact same time across the world. For the lower elementary kids, it's really pretty simple. Uh, they have a subject where they have some sort of challenge they're facing. It could be a physical challenge doing something in the world. It could be a social challenge. Um, they've done topics on animals, the environment. Uh, this year is wonderful. This entire year is focused entirely on space and space exploration since it is the 50th anniversary of the landing on the moon. They wanted to make all the programs uniform this year. So they're given a challenge and then what they do is these little tiny groups is they uh, tackle the challenge. They do some research, they talk about it, and they develop a little Lego display that has to have a moving part in it somewhere. So they learn about movement and, and, and the challenge of building something that has to function. And then they create a little display, and at their events, they meet judges, and they present before judges, and they tell them what they learned and how exciting it was and what they, they grew in their development changes throughout that process. So then when you go to the next group, so the upper elementary kids, it gets a little bit more complicated. Now they actually have full-on competition. They have a field, they have a subject, they have a challenge or a series of processes, they have these missions that are out on this field, and they as a group meet, they determine how they want to go after these challenges, how they want to play these missions, and they have to build, construct, and program 
a Lego robot that's going to play on that field and do things. At the same time, the secondary part, which I love about this as well, is that they have to research a problem dealing with that particular thing. So I think this year was deep space exploration, whether it's the functional problems of building a base on a planet, uh, anything about food and exercise, the things we face as human beings, the solitude of being out in space, etc. They get to choose whatever they want to research. And that group goes through and researches a problem, determines what they would do as a solution, and then they create a presentation. So they have to learn how to present, they create props, sometimes they have costumes, it's very exciting. Uh, but they play matches then with their robot doing their missions, and then they present before judges the problem that they thought was important and how they would meet that problem head on. So that's how they do it. So then you take the next giant leap, which is middle school. So now we go into an even bigger challenge when it comes to co competition. In LEGO League, they play on a field, they're all by themselves. They're just meeting those challenges, doing what they want to do. Well, now when you get to middle school, you're actually playing head-to-head. -head. There are two teams partnered against two teams that are partnered, and they play on a much bigger field. It's 12 feet by 12 feet. It's in front of them. They drive their robots rather than just having them pre-programmed. They build them from scratch. It's not Legos. It's metal. We're talking about you know, giant erector sets, but they can manufacture pieces. They learn about design and prototyping. Uh, they wire, they program, they do that whole aspect and they compete for that. But then we're also introducing more and more things to those kids. They learn about doing outreach, reaching out to other schools, teaching them about STEM, talking to parents, talking to professionals. They have to document their whole engineering process. So learning to deal with their failures, when things don't work, how they learn from them, change, make decisions, grow from that. They learn a lot more about dealing with interpersonal conflicts and personality differences and you're talking a bigger team with bigger decisions so how you make those decisions with a lot of dissenting opinions and they also present to the judges but it's a much bigger presentation they have uh, more that they have to do and explain they have to talk about their engineering process they have to talk about what outreach they do if they do fundraising etc you're talking about the expenses are getting more so they're also getting more business focused as well, not just STEM sort of things. And then the last and final step of the program is the high school. The high school changes entirely. We are talking full-sized, human-sized robots, 120 pounds, completely manufactured from scratch. You have to do and design and figure out everything on your own. Same thing, we get a challenge that's released at the same time all across the planet. You have six weeks to brainstorm, prototype, design, build, wire, program, test, retest, fail, test again, <laughs> try again, over and over again, same thing. We play on, as, as Mr. Sher was talking about, we play on a big, big field, and we play three on three, and these are big, big robots. On top of that, now you're talking an even grander scale about outreach. We're holding STEM camps for little kids, and we're doing the Delta STEM Festival every year, and we're hosting, we're actually helping to host the events for the younger teens so that they have some place to play. Um, it's a lot more fundraising. You're talking thousands and thousands of dollars. We are self-funded. All of these are clubs. They're not, you know, it's, they have to pay for themselves. So the kids are not just learning STEM skills, which are amazing. The amount of direct connect they have to industry professionals, all of the people who run these teams are volunteers. They're all parents and adult professionals in the community here. So it's not, they're not hired trained professionals, we're just all people who want to give to these kids. And we believe that this program is really important, not just for their development, but our development as a world. Like they are the ones who are going to figure out the messes we make, how to fix them. So <laughs> we want to give them the tools to do that. So it's a really wonderful program from the process of not only do they gain STEM skills, but they are learning everything from teamwork and cooperation and competition, how to fail and pick yourself up and, and continue on. Um, business management, project management, fundraising, budgeting, I mean like everything is slowly integrated into the program so that they're only given as much as they can particularly handle at each level. And then it just gets crazier and crazier as you go. So 
One of the things I want to do, and I'm, I'm one of the, the mentors on Dow High's high school team, but I work with all the teams in Midland Public Schools to give you an idea how many we have. We have one both, we have a high school team at both Midland High and Dow High. Between Jefferson and Northeast, we have six middle school teams currently. Um, at the um, Lego League level, so the upper elementary level, we have six, six teams. At three of the schools, we're working on getting the rest of the schools on board with some of the construction that was going on this year. We were kind of like, it was difficult. So we're working on that. And then um, the FLL Junior Program, which is also just starting right now, we have 13 teams across four schools. So very busy. And again, we still have more schools we got to bring on board, so we're working on it. Um, what you're going to see as we go through the hallway here is we have all of the middle school teams and all of the high school teams work together in this building. So we'll kind of go through and I'll show you where it is. So in total, at any given time, we have upwards of nine teams working here at one time. A uh, number of students, to give you an idea, the high school teams combined, it's changing because this is the beginning of our season. So we're just starting to bring more kids on board. But I would say we have 100 plus students involved in our two teams. High school is not limited. We can have as big a team as we want. Middle school teams are limited, so in our middle school teams we have about 75 kids participating in the program. Um, Lego League and Lego League Junior are also limited. The team sizes have to be pretty small. So in Lego League we have about 50 or so, and in FLL Junior we have like 78 or so. So we have a lot of kids that are involved in the program, and they don't have to, unlike school where you're supposed to go first grade and second grade and so on, these programs don't work that way. So you can join a high school team having never participated in any other level. So you can jump in at any particular time. You have no need to have any previous knowledge or skills or anything of that kind. That's why we're here, we teach them. So I'm gonna just kind of walk you through. We're gonna see the gym where the field is. It's kind of boring right now, I'm sorry. Our kickoff was just Saturday. All day Friday and all day Saturday, so we welcome people to come to see. But basically what's going to happen is this field is going to be full of stone. So this year our, our theme is space, so there's going to be four rocket ships on the outside walls. So there's going to be two cargo bay ships built in the center of the field. And then we're going to have some platforms, which are the habitats. And you play three on three, so you're talking big size robots. And you're going to see them in just a minute because there are a whole bunch of them in the room that we're about to go into. So what this allows is this gift has made it so that our entire region um, has a place for teams to practice. And as soon as we put the pieces, build all the pieces in here, um, it's incredibly important. Anybody who's ever tried to build something to do something, it's far, far easier to know it's going to work if you actually have the ability to test it. So that's what it allows us to do is we're going to build the entire set of practice elements in here. And then um, we will open this up to all the area teams. So um, uh, we have people from Saginaw, Bay City, uh, Freeland. There we just contact all the high school teams. And there are about 38 of them in our region. And just say, hey, if you want to come and practice with us or at some time and want to check things out, this is open so that you guys can come and hang out with us while we're working. So we often do have a lot of teams that come and visit us and will use our space in order to test their own machines so that when we actually get to play, we've all kind of had the same footprint ability to sort of work out things as uh, equal as we can. So yes, so we stole their gym. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we're very excited. This was one of the biggest, most exciting parts of moving from Franklin to here is that Franklin had like a three-quarter size gym, so we never could fit a whole field in it. So we were very excited when we moved here. We were like, put the field up, let's go. So unfortunately, all the wood used to be things, but we had to clean it all off so that we could start our new field. So I'm going to go ahead and walk us through a couple of the workrooms so that you can get a feel for like what we're talking about from the space that we're dealing with. Um, on this end of the building is Midland High, so they're kind of like protecting this side. <laughs> Um, but here's one of the workrooms, and none of you has to have safety glasses on. I'm not going to turn anything on. Notice so the fireplace in the for the chair. This is the manufacturing room. This is where you're going to cut metal. You can see they're already starting, like our, I was explaining that our um, challenge was just released Saturday. So they're already working on the frame of their next robot. So already starting to make decisions about what size it's going to be and what it's going to do. Um, you can see right here, this is an old one from a previous year. So sometime 
Sometimes they're tall, sometimes they're short, but overall they're always about 120 pounds and you build them and you're gonna see a wide range of structures as we go through these rooms. They are built specifically to achieve whatever goals in that game we're trying to play. So the what we design and even between like what Minlam High's team will design versus what my team will design for the same exact game, they could look entirely, entirely different. We are friendly, we help each other, we share stuff, but we are entirely independent when it comes to what we want to do, what choices we make as a team. All the teams are very much like that. Even our teams in the middle schools and the grade schools, they know each other and can collaborate, but they build entirely separate. They are an independent, completely independent of each other. So um, we'll just kind of peek in as we go through. So their area continues on down this hallway, um, only because like if you see the amount of space it takes to make a robot, one room would not do it, especially when you have like 40 or 50 kids. So here's another space and also another robot, an older robot if you want to see. So the last one you looked at was kind of maybe mid-thigh high. Um, this would be last year's robot of theirs. So significantly taller. Um, prior to that, I think that was from two, maybe three years ago. So shape, et cetera, is very much dictated by what you needed to accomplish that particular year. Um, and you can see as we go through this too, and there's another little short one right there under the table. <laughs> little tiny ones so you can hide it. And they will look very unique. Um, so one of the other wonderful things that it does is it gives uh, students an opportunity. We develop sponsors. So they learn business relationships. And that's one of the things you'll see a lot on that uh, we're kind of like NASCAR. We decorate our robots for our sponsors in order to thank them, to, to make sure that they know that we appreciate all the money and the mentors and the time that they put into our um, organization. So I'm gonna poke us back out again into the hall. I promise I will let you leave. We're walking towards the door. All right, so this is one of the really cool things. So um, this was the first year our, well, our FTC program, our middle school program has been expanding. Um, it's relatively new, I think we've had them. We've had one team for a while, but the actual program growing has only really exploded in the last three years. So what we decided to do is we wanted to give them a home base space that is entirely theirs. So we don't encroach, the high school teams don't encroach on it, but during their season, so their season is the fall and ours is now, there, during their season, we open many of our rooms to let them meet in our spaces because there are just too many of their teams to fit in this one room, and they all want to meet all the time. So, <laughs> and I totally understand that, but I do want you to see kind of scale-wise the difference. So if you go in there, there's the FTC field from this year is set up with a couple of robots on it. So I'll have, you, I'll have us all go in here so you can just take a look. Kind of an actual game would look like. You would have four robots moving. <laughs> <laughs> and they would be playing and this year this is their actual field this is a live real actual field so they're supposed to be on like the surface of the moon these are craters that they're supposed to be fit, picking up like mining they're supposed to be mining for different kinds of um, elements and things and then uh, they have to put them in the moon lander because mm. they need to take them home and so different sections of the moon lander can hold different mining elements so it's the whole idea of you know, having to be able to pick up things, separate things, put them in the right categories, etc. On top of it, you can see there are these like little handles on the side. They had to start hanging from those, lower themselves, and then at the end, if they could climb back up there, they got extra points. Because the idea being, you don't leave your rover on the moon, you have to take it home with you. So you mine and do all of your work, and then you put it back on your lander and you go home. So they do base it very much on, I don't want to say necessarily real world, there's some fantasy in this obviously, but they do try and make it so that it's practical things that potentially they might go into if they were in, excited about various STEM fields. So picking up and sorting and space and you know, I mean a lot of that is very practical and usable and you'll see, you guys are welcome to come here closer. Um, that, Everything is very different. So although you might look and be like, oh, okay, they're all about the same size. Um, the wheels they use, the structure they use, how they're picking things up is all very unique to their design, their team, 
and the practice that they've done and the changes they've made based on the learnings they had from testing. So again, that's why they have their own field, because the same thing, they need to be able to have a place where they can check and see, did what we design, is it capable of doing what we thought? Because we all know our imaginations are fantastic. <laughs> We're always perfect when we think about it, right? So this is um, middle school. And I'll kind of walk you down through the end here. Basically how we have it structured is Midland High has one end, because we wanted to set it up so that if we have guests, We've got both of the like the head high schools kind of managing our guests that we can keep an eye on out of everybody. So we put Midland High on one end and then Dow High to the other end and in between we put the middle school and some of our friend teams when they visit and so on and so forth. So the middle section is kind of more of our share spaces where teams come in and kind of collaborate when the FTC, FTC teams are here and we kind of need to spread them out <laughs> so that they each have their space. Um, during season, you will see tables in the hall, kids in the hall, researching stuff, computers booted up. We sprawl everywhere. <laughs> the more kids you have, you know, the more spaces you need. So, um, but if you continue down this way, uh, the hall, they're all very different in their structure. Some with chains, some with cables, some have arms, etc. just depending on what they needed to do. But I'm going to tell you this work, all done by kids. So they might come in not knowing anything, but this electrical layout, all of this wiring was headed by our, our lead electrical who's an 18-year-old girl. So she heads up an electrical team. They learn all about soldering, wire crimping, how electricity works, everything. Um, we have a mechanical team that designs a CAD team. So if you know anything about computer and computer-aided design, they're figuring out the position of everything. Where does that motor go? Do I need a bump up here? Do I need a nut and a bolt? How does it interact with everything? Um, and then we have an entire programming team whose job it is to figure out how to tell it what to do with all these things. How do I run the motors? And how far does that motor make that wheel turn so I know how fast I'm going? There's a whole section of our game that is done with no human involvement. So in the very beginning of the game, the robot drives itself based on what the programmers have told it to do. So they have to know every aspect and what controls what and everything. It's a lot of work. We always tease the, the, the programmers that they can fix anything. <laughs> fix it in the code. But so you'll see a lot of varying designs, but I just want to be very clear that in all these cases, the middle school kids, this is from kids. This is not, we don't, the professionals don't come in and just build this and hand this to the students. This is entirely their brainstorming, their prototyping, their design, their tests, their rebuilds, everything. We have adult supervisors there to make sure they're safe, that they know how to use the equipment, to answer questions if they're fully stuck. Because let's be honest, 16 year olds are not engineers yet. Um, but they're there in case they need some, a little bit of tweak guidance to push them in the right direction. But we don't just hand them the answers. This isn't about a bunch of grown-ups getting together and playing a game with kids. It's about giving the kids the experience, but guarding them and guiding them in that experience so that they're learning as they're going. Um, and I'll take you through the last balls. I mean, like various things here, but part of why we keep them, first of all, they're great for demos. So if we want to show them to kids or have kids come in, it's a great way for them to see and touch and look at lights and mechanisms and whatnot. But on top of it, they're great learning tools. So if we can say, hey, a couple years ago, we had to do something similar. Look at that one. Let's not copy it, but look at it and kind of get your juices flowing. Because sometimes that's the hardest part is the first leap of, of it feels like magic. How do I make it real? And so that's actually what they've been doing here. They're like designs and measurements and we're getting to the point where we're like, all right, you've had great ideas, put the math on them. <laughs> we need to make sure that physics works, <laughs> that the designs are mathematically sound before we actually start building anything. So this is gonna be kind of where we assemble things. So all the parts will come up here. This is where they'll start actually putting the wiring into the robots. Um, they'll start assembling everything, putting together all the pieces. We'll do all of our testing in the gym. Um, but here's kind of where it's made. You might want to talk about marketing with the toolboxes. Oh, the, so, so one of the things that, that we do, like I was talking about, we do a lot of outreach and fundraising, et cetera. So um, one of the big things that you're also doing in this whole process is they also learn a whole heck of a lot about branding, 
about um, your public face, public relations, and whatnot, because uh, a lot of it comes down to developing relationships not only with your community, but your sponsors, developing relationships within the sporting community, so all of the other robotics teams, it's becoming recognizable. So one of the projects that we did last year was covering our tool chests and making them so when they are in our space at a competition, it clearly looks like the Dow High team, that they can tell that we're there, it's got our name all over it. Um, you'll see a lot of times our robots have branding on them as well, so that the idea being that when you're on the field, not only do we want to celebrate our relationships with our sponsors, but we also want to make um, relationships with other teams so that we can trust each other, depend on each other, get to know each other. So it is very much about kind of not necessarily learning to be an extrovert, but learning to be comfortable being in a large group, a lot of people, kind of making connections, etc. One of the really brilliant things about this program going into High School and Beyond is the serious number of internships, networking, and enormous amount of scholarships available. There's, I think, two years ago, the amount was over $20 million in scholarships. And it's like, I think they said the average was about one every four applicants. And it's not all STEM based, sometimes it's specific college based, sometimes it's program based, but we've had kids get business scholarships, nursing scholarships, it really is very, very open. So I highly recommend it. It's also one of those things that we've heard from multiple universities that seeing I was on a first team is a big bonus to getting in because they know that those kids are driven, uh, that they know how to work on teams, um, and that they know how to handle and be perseverance, how to handle like falling, failing forward, basically, how to, how to keep yourself motivated, um, and dealing with tight deadlines. <laughs> dealing with tight deadlines. Um, I'm gonna walk you through just our last mechanical room and then, and then we're done. Only because I wanna, we maybe a couple of things too. Because everyone's home, we get kids who are like, hang out with dad or mom in the garage and build their own things. But that's part of what our job is, is if they're interested, we're gonna show you how to use this stuff. Now, this isn't for free. This wasn't just handed to us. You can imagine these are pretty expensive. So this is a secondary aspect of it. We had to get the funds for these. So the kids learn how to write grant proposals, how to find grants, um, how to budget an entire project, like where do I buy this, how do I get it here, what kind of tooling and special things do I need, what is its whole budget. It's not just I go to the store and I buy this for $3,000. It's like, well, no, you have to get it. Like, it has to be on a truck or something, so how do you get it there? And, oh, by the way, you also need all the bits and pieces that go with it, so it's not just, I buy this once and I'm done, but it's also then learning maintenance. How do you take care of your things? Because we don't just have another $3,000 to buy this if we bring it. So it's also learning to respect your tools, learning to uh, appreciate the value of all the things that you're, you're using, etc., um, that whole measure twice, cut once, there's a reason for that because every piece of metal you cut wrong is a piece of metal we just spend money on. So it's very much about, they know all about where their money comes from, how it gets spent, etc. They are very much involved with the entire process from top to bottom. So it, it definitely is a very unique and organic thing because you will notice going through Midland High, their setup is entirely different, how they use their rooms is entirely different. The teams share a lot of the same things, but they're also allowed to be completely who they are. So they go on the path that they want. Really the biggest thing that we share, being all part of the Midland Public Schools Robotics Program, is a single kind of set of philosophies, which is our main goal is did you learn something? At the end of the year, did you learn something? It can be anything, and it can be STEM related, it can be I learned how to speak in public, I learned how to do a budget, I learned, but did you learn things? Um, that's an important tenet of this. Um, did, you, did you meet the challenge? So did you build something? It doesn't matter if it won or it lost. It did great or it just kind of barely survived. But did you build something? Did you put it on the floor? Did you meet the challenge? Did you make decisions? Did you do the thing that you went out to do? That's a major one. And the last one is, did you have fun? Because if we don't enjoy what we're doing, why are we doing this, right? So this is a really big part of it is, giving them the skills, but also teaching them that this can be really exciting, that it's really just about what you decide you want to get out of it. So anyway, thank you everybody thank for you. coming in. If you ever 
ever want to actually take a tour while there are people in here, <laughs> you're welcome to. Um, most of the time, like uh, Mr. Cher was saying, we meet pretty much all the time. Um, in the evenings and on Saturdays are our big times. Um, like I said, FTC's in the fall, and they're in the evenings on Sundays. So, uh, yeah, all there's pretty much there's a team here at some point in time. So <laughs> you can always stop by, and uh, we'll walk you through. You can Thank see you. it live. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.